Ways and Means, and it is June 10th. It's actually my son's birthday. I did call him and wish him a happy birthday already, so I got under the wire on that. Um, and uh, we are continuing a discussion that we started yesterday on the CRF money. Um, and Sorsha has prepared a, a document that uh, helps us summarize what uh, committee members were looking at yesterday. We can uh, go back to that and make corrections and additions and whatever else we want to do. Um, and But I also want to have a discussion about whether we actually produce anything to share with House Appropriations um, and whether that document feels like something that uh, people want to share. And um, if it's not, um, some discussion about what we would communicate to them. Um, so we have um, plenty of time to explore this, um, think about it. And uh, Graham has done a little more thinking about the idea that I threw out there of doing a uh, tax holiday um, and we'll uh, have him talk about that. And he's got a, another idea around childcare um, or has done some work around that and is aware of what another committee is doing. Um, so once we're done with that, we will talk about school construction bill. Um, and really the question that I've got is whether we're, we're so far apart from what the um, administration wants us to do, whether there's a way to meet there, I'm not sure whether there is. So we'll, um, we'll tackle that as well. And I also wanted to mention that um, I've, I actually went into the committee room and looked on the wall to see if there were bills that were sitting there that we'd gotten that I'd totally forgotten about or whatever, um, just to, uh, make sure that while we had some time, we used it effectively. And there really isn't, I can tell you what is on the wall um, in terms of bills that were referred in. Um, I didn't look at the bills that uh, were originally introduced and came in the committee. There are a lot of those as people know, um, but I always feel that if another committee sends us a bill, we have an obligation to take it up and, um, and act on it one way or another. So, uh, so that's all I've got. I also wanted to ask Scott um, whether you had, um, had, I know you'd communicated with Senate Finance. I don't know whether you'd met with them or not, but just wondered if you could check in on that. Right. Um, so actually they met yesterday. Okay. And I sat, I sat in and uh, Mark testified and Abby and Secretary French on the topic um chloe wexler was there as well um and so i went over the i went over the high points of the bill with them um, let them know what our goals were um clean give people their t uh, be able to send out tax bills let the districts know that um that they're going to get the money that their voters requested and that uh talked about the the strategy for retiring a deficit in 21 if there is a deficit in 21 uh, they were they were curious you know why did we try to refill the reserve fully in FY 21 and I explained our, our thought process and our conversation with the treasurer and mm -hmm. um, they didn't seem to have any big problems with with anything that was in there I think they appreciated the simplicity and the cleanness of it and um, Senator McDonald actually seemed pretty happy so we'll see what happens I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, any questions for Scott on where that is? Was there discussion about the fact that the hole that we were looking at had um, redu been reduced a bit? There was. Uh, Mark showed him the uh, the same Ed Fund outlook that he showed us um, with the the revised number, and they were happy about that. And they were, uh, I don't know, if they were surprised, but also happy to know that that number does not include any federal dollars at this point. Right. Um, ESSER or CRF or anything else. So, um, you know, there's nothing that improves people's moods like improving the number by 50 million. So, I know that's we're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was amazing. Um, so, um, still a problem, but uh, much more kind of problem you can get your mind around. Right. Uh, so, 
Well, good. Um, hopefully they'll vote soon. I, I do think from what I've heard that the, um, uh, they may add the money that's being set aside for the Ed Fund to that bill. Um, I think that's what the plan is. So they might, yeah, they'll, they'll have better data when they make their decision. So, right, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so let's. Everybody got the um, the summary that Sersha prepared from the discussion yesterday. Um, do people have comments about it? Thoughts about it? This, I'm, I'm really looking for guidance. I don't. Um, I don't think we got it. Um, Robin said she did. I, I, I did. It, it, was, it was an email. It was an email that Sorsha sent to us yesterday at, uh, well, it says CRF list of discussion items. She sent it at 12.35 yesterday. I was gonna say it was sort of midday because I got it, I think when we were still on the floor. Yeah, well, uh, we'll put, I'm sorry, that's okay. Um, we can put it up and look at it. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking for guidance from the committee. I don't have a particular plan in mind or you know, a goal of doing X um, in terms of our response. I'm um, open to what committee members uh, want to suggest. So let me get That's my only list. part of the chart. Um, There's two more categories after broadband. Okay, the PDF didn't transfer properly. Give me a second. Okay. See that Graham is still with us. Hi, Graham. Good morning, still here. <laughs> We're glad that you're with us. Um, okay. So Graham's child might come at the same time that my next grandchild arrives because that one's due in a week and a half. So we're getting into uh, yeah, similar territory. All righty, here we go. Um, so I thought Sorsha did a nice job sort of capturing the kinds of ideas that we were looking at. I'm not sure, um, um, she wasn't sure, and neither am I, that whether she captured all of it. And um, and I also, I keep going back to the same question, is this, is this, um, do we feel that this document is something that we want to spend more time on and that it has value? Um, or do we want to just say to the House Appropriations Committee, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to look at this and um, we don't have a uh, recommendation. Um, so I'm open. So if people want to offer some thoughts. Scott. So um, I thought about this a little bit overnight and um, based on our conversation yesterday where a lot of people had a really, I think a lot of good ideas and it looks like a lot of these ideas that to me, it seems that other committees are dealing with them. And so I circled back to, I just really think that the easiest and we've done it before, we know how to do it. Um, and it would boost a, an industry that is just reeling right now um, across the state is um, a meals and room holiday or tax credit of some sort. Uh, Robin. Thanks. Um, I would like to hear more about the holiday tax credit and also um, would like to maybe see if there's anything in the community grants that's actually allowable. Um, I, I agree with Scott that there are a lot of things that are being looked at in other committees. And without mm -hmm. hearing from all the other committees what their priorities are, it's kind of, yeah, um, you know, that's not, and that's not what we're supposed to be doing, so. 
What do you mean by community grant? I didn't, that's not. Well, something. that was under Scott's, um, he was talking about, um, is there something that we could do to support? I, I can't speak for Scott. I, I just remember being a little bit intrigued when he brought that up. Emily had talked about local gift cards. You know, I was, I was, my thought was, is that, you know, if I'm, I'm kind of philosophically of the belief that when it comes to um, doing projects that support communities, that communities are best suited to identify those and, and to develop those. And if we're thinking along the lines of projects, then maybe we should just be thinking about, um, you know, providing grants to communities, whether that's on a per capita or a request or, or what basis, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Peter. I, uh, I agree uh, with Scott that the communities probably are best suited to make that decision. I hope, um, and I would support that. I'm, I'm a, a fan of revenue sharing of some sort with local communities. I made a pitch for arts venues. Uh, and as far as I know, that's one of the major hurts that the restaurant and lodging um, industry has suffered because all the arts have shut down. And uh, they were a major, if you will, boost to uh, the going out for dinner but I didn't get any takers at that. So I'll go back and say restaurants and some kind of community grants, as long as the communities feel safe in uh, defending the nexus, because they would, they would be subject to the liability if they did not meet that criteria. Um, on that last point, I'm, I'm not sure if that's right. Um, so that there's been some discussion around that and I'm not at all expert on it. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm not sure who, who has the risk. Um, but, uh, but, so I'm gonna, uh, I know Graham is here, <laughs> still here. Um, uh, he sent me an email this morning about the um, tax holiday and also um, there's a childcare tax credit that's been discussed as well that's in another committee and um so graham why don't well let's talk first of all about the holiday and then we can talk about child care separately sure um so um i've been thinking a little bit more about the tax holiday and i've been mostly thinking about what i've been calling the first hurdle of whether this is a permissible expense and i said yesterday that i thought it was getting dangerous or dangerous I was getting close to revenue replacement um, and so what our office did is we have a group within our office that evaluates these things we weren't quite we weren't a hundred percent sure about it because it could have been it could easily be um, uh, rephrased as an economic development thing um, and so we wanted to see if if any other state had been doing this and so we reached out to NCSL and asked them what they thought they think this would be a permissible expense um, and they have been really keeping track of what other states are doing and they have been speaking to the treasury um, directly and they did not think that this would be a permissible use of CRF funds. Um, the <clears throat> in thinking about how you might structure it to achieve sort of the same goal so I interpreted the goal here as sort of um, uh, bringing people to restaurants in order to help restaurants um, and through more customers. And one potential way that you might be able to do this in a permissible way would be to, um, would be to have restaurants um, issue or say they're going to have a 10% off week or a couple days um, for the meals tax, or did they'll just say we'll offer 10% off all meals for up to X amount of days. Um, and then what the state would do would um, issue um, like an advanced refund tax credit to reimburse them for those meals um, that they took the discount on. So that would probably be, a, in my estimation, more likely to be a permissible expense, so long as you got the money out by December um by december 31st and so um and it is i think more permissible because at that point you're not it's not revenue replacement it's almost acting as if it's a grant to um to restaurants which is quite similar to what we're doing 
um, in, the, in the economic recovery package um, that's going through both houses right now. So um, there is a way I think you might be able to do it. It's a little more complicated. It's not as simple um, and direct, um, but you could, in theory, achieve the same goal through uh, some sort of credit like that. So I'll pause there before I talk about the child care stuff. Yeah. Let me see if there's questions or thoughts from anybody. It's not you and I seem to be the ones who are sort of most interested in trying to make this work. What are your thoughts? If you're speaking, you're muted. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a credit might get get us the same the same place. Um, it just would be really nice to help these this the restaurant industry out. They're just really they're going to have. I think it's just brutal. Can't even. Um, you know, if it, everybody's focused on the outside right now, we're going inside in three months, and they're going to be hurting. You mean right now you can have outside dining, dining right? But but in three months, you know, everybody starts to move inside, and if they can't, right. we can't get them to get people to go into restaurants again. And within three months, then right. we might lose. Yeah. Who knows how much of that industry? I mean, I think uh, one. Yeah. Go ahead. I was say, one thing that would need to be ironed out with the credit is unlike a tax holiday where you sort of have an, you can make a guess at how much it will cost if you tell restaurants they can offer 10% off. Um, we can make a guess, but you know, what if restaurants end up selling way more meals than we expect? I guess maybe that problem exists with the holiday, um, but you might end up breaching your 5 million, um, I guess, cap or your allotment here um, under both situations. But I'm trying to think whether that would happen more under sort of an advanced refund credit. Um, but you do run that risk in, I think, maybe both cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of, uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing, and I think some of the, the um, impact of a proposal like this is kind of lost if it's a 10% off your meal. Um, what people really like doing is not paying taxes. Right. Um, <laughs> that's what they like. Um, and if it were possible for the restaurant to say this is tax free, even though we're making it tax free by way of a credit, that might be one thing. But if they can't say that, then I, I think, I just think some of it is just sort of lost. Um, it would be great if it cost a lot, that mean people were going out and eating, but, um, but it's, I, I'm not, anyway, I'm sort of mixed feelings about it. Uh, Robin, Sam and Bill. Um, and other ideas too, we're not yeah. to be stuck here, so. Well, staying on this one for the moment, since we have no idea, I mean, can we cap it? You could do a, you know, to a maximum amount of whatever. I, I don't know how else we would do it because we have X amount of dollars, so. Um, and so would it would it be that, that they actually don't collect the taxes? They call it a 10% off, but they wouldn't actually collect a meals tax? No, it'd be the other way around. They would collect the meals tax and, and um, we would call it a 10% off. We would not collect it. They get to keep it, we don't. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think, are um, you talking about the credit? Is, yeah. Yes, is the, the credit yeah, the credit them for the tax. Yeah, they would still collect the tax. They would just be collecting it all on a smaller base. Um, and then we would essentially send the, the, the difference between what, they're, what they would have charged and what they did charge. Yeah. Okay. Sam, Bill, Joey, and Scott, and it looks to me like Jim has his hand up. What happened to your blue blue hand? <laughs> You're gonna have to get in the list here. Um, Bill. um I no. Oh, Sam. I'm sorry, Sam. Got I, the hand I thought, down. I, I, I thought you called. I thought you called on me. I um, then the I, hand. I don't we run into this. I mean, if we do rooms and meals tax holiday don't we end up shorting the ed fund i mean it's uh the whole thing seems kind of complicated to me 
Well, it's 25%. So uh, yes, that the 5 million that we have, um, well, it depends, actually, I'm not sure. It depends on how the money flows. Um, you could money. redirect, I mean, you'd reimburse yourself for $5 million and then just direct the money to both yeah. funds. I just wonder if that falls into revenue replacement again. I don't that's, know. That's the problem with the whole idea is that it's very hard to do it and do it effectively without it feeling like revenue replacement. Um, even though I think of it really as more <clears throat> marketing and economic development in my mind. That's how it will, that's why it's worth doing. Um, and, and, what, and what if like yeah. RDCs or something like gave grants, does it, I mean. They're doing, they're doing grants. I just don't know how much they're doing, but I know other committees are looking at grants um, for okay. restaurants. Um, okay. I, I figure that I remember seeing somewhere was 62,000, was that, does that ring a bell with somebody? I've yeah, that's in, something the, like that. that's in the, the bill that's being, that's been the bill that's, that's I think passed Senate Economic Development and I think mm -hmm. it's going into appropriations. There's a, a right. grant in there for, for restaurants. Yeah. hotels and um, yeah. retailers. Yeah. Uh, Bill, Joey, Scott, Jim. Oh, Jim got his hand up. Good. Okay, Bill. So are we going to put a time limit on this? And mm -hmm. if there's a, a surge in COVID in the fall, are we going to, are this business is going to be clamoring for the redo? Yeah. Well, if the, if something like this works, it on, it only works if you do it with a bang, like for two weekends, and you do it uh, in July probably when you know people when we're trying to get people back in. But other than that, it probably doesn't work at all. Um, Joey, are we? Are we going to hear from the restaurant association or people about how they feel this would be? impact their business and if it's a good idea and if it's worth doing and if they'd rather just have the cash yeah, yeah. something like that i yeah. think it'd be important to hear yeah. from them i agree yep scott and jim so one thing i i think i i think i know this um is that presently in vermont a business cannot um run a promotion that says you know we'll pay your sales tax that's, that's not allowed in the state of Vermont, as far as I know. And I'm just assuming that it ex extends to the, the meals and rooms tax, kind of like you can't have a happy hour or something like that. Um, so what if we you know, sent this out to them as a credit or, or a grant based, and we'd have to base that on something which would probably be their, their uh, rooms and meals tax reported in some month, July, August, I don't know what it is. And, and uh, you just make the math work. We know what we know what we collected in, in rooms and meals taxes and we know what we could send out. And then you just, you drop that, um, you, you notwithstand and drop that moratorium um, for you know, a brief period of time. And then the businesses can, could use that, that grant to cover the discount that they'd effectively be giving by um, by not by not by taking the meals and rooms out of their out of their hide. I think I think that's sort of a version of what Graham was talking about. Is it? Um, yeah, I don't know what the legal parameters are. So, if I understand right, the idea would be that the business would essentially be paying the meals and rooms tax, so they would charge the customer. Essentially, they would be paying the meals and rooms tax on behalf of the customer, and then they, so in effect, giving the customer ten percent off. And then what we would do is reimburse them for the tax that they paid. Right? Um, I don't know about. That's slightly different than what I was saying. What I was saying is that they would just make their meals cheaper, and then we would reimburse them for the revenue that they are for the cost of doing so. Um, I don't know what would have to be done, nor I don't. I'm not aware of the, the language about whether businesses can can pay sales tax or not. So I'd kind of have to before I give any sort of uh, yeah. thoughts on it. I, ask I, Abby how you would do that or how it would I, work. I think I think the way a business would do this is if if the state had a program and they said, 
here's a grant, you know, some amount of money that we're going to give you. And for this period of time, you can run a no sales, no rooms and meals and rooms tax promotion. What, you, what a business in a competitive environment would do is they would say, hmm, we can use that grant to offset the discount we're gonna, get, we're gonna be effectively giving by not collecting the, the that, that's, how, that's how a business would do that. They would, they would do that to, to increase their revenue, to increase their bottom line if you gave them those two tools. And if you had one or two in a community took advantage of it, the others would follow suit real quickly because they don't want to be the ones that aren't doing that. that. That's how a business would, would react to those two things. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I, I think it's it's a it's another iteration of what I'm saying. And in, in yeah. my judgment of looking at the guidance, is that that's closer to what I was suggesting this morning, and therefore is more likely to be a permissible use of the money. Um, and so I, I can work with Abby on this and see how that something like that might work if that's what the committee would like. Um, Jim, finally. Well, here's a wacky idea, completely wacky. Optics are bad, won't fly, but you'll see where I'm headed, I guess, which is what if during this two week period or whatever we're talking about, um, we double the tax and then we give twice as much money back to the restaurants. <laughs> well, I mean, we, I mean, I'm trying to figure out a way. To... <laughs> New Hampshire's loving you, Jim. What's that? <laughs> New Hampshire's loving you. Well, but we're giving it all back, Scott. Anyway, this is offered as a concept, but I don't know how to do it, you know? So I, I appreciate the creativity here. Um, <laughs> I, think the, I think the issue is that, with that one, is that it is the, it's the consumer who pays the meals and rooms tax in both cases. So I think you would have to do something in statute, or I don't know how it would work, but yep. the money, if you're going to refund it back, in some way, like you're suggesting, the money has to go to the consumer, not to the restaurant, um, because in, it, the tax belongs or the tax is paid by the consumer. So we had the same. We had this issue come up with the with the um, with the tax deferral question a couple months ago. Is you know, can you just give? Can you just tell restaurants, hey, you don't have to send in the tax as a way of providing them some relief. The answer is no, because it's actually the consumer that pays the tax. So exactly, yeah. Um, part of what's uh, tr difficult about the uh, navigating this, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. The the other <coughs> the other <coughs> idea that I was sort of trying to figure out this weekend is whether an amnesty made sense. But basically, the tax department what an amnesty is is you you um, don't. Uh, assess penalties and interest. You still have to pay the tax, typically, um, and that's basically what the tax department did um, on their own. Um, so, um, I and I think that has the same problem. Um, Emily, I'm going to get to you in one second. I just got an email from Austin Davis um, at the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce about an idea um, which it's, it, it's not, not restaurants, it's not what we're talking about here. It has to do with uh, nonprofits. And I'm gonna, I, I don't know much about it. I'm gonna forward it to Sorsha and, um, and so the committee can look at it. Uh, Emily. Um, the thing I like about Jim's proposal is that I know a lot of people double tax the tax when they're figuring out their tip. And so we'd be getting a lot more money to wait staff and bartenders. Um, so one of my concerns um, about, I guess just generally the short-term spending, but particularly the proposal for restaurants is that they're, they're gonna be really sustained challenges for them. Um, you know, especially if um, as we go into next winter and outside seating isn't available and that's gonna be a lot of where the business model this summer that's sustaining them is sitting in. Um, and so I'm nervous that by doing sort of a quick boost 
um, we're sort of like artificially inflating a recovery that really needs to be more nimble. Um, and what we need to be putting our energy into is helping them figure out a new business model in some way. And so, which I don't think is necessarily like what our committee would do very well since we don't spend any time talking to the restaurant industry. And so, um, so I think that's where I'm a little stuck on this proposal. Well, and, and I, uh, you know, if we, if we wanted to keep this moving along, it would only be in conceptual form because we haven't talked to the restaurant um, folks. And I had the similar question that Joey had, is this, if we want to help, is this the right way to help? I guess that's really what you're asking too, Emily. Um, so um, is that, Sarsha, do you have that uh, document? Did I just send it to you? Um, yes, I forwarded it to the committee members. It'll take me a moment to get it ready to share on the okay. screen. And it says it's it's essentially unreviewed by me. I got it while I was sitting here, but it's, it was somebody who listened to our discussion yesterday, um, Austin Davis, and had an idea that had to do with nonprofits that I thought was worth sharing with the committee. Uh, Scott. Just uh, kind of, uh, I was thinking about Emily's comment and something I'd said earlier about the the problem we are going to have when the restaurant industry has to move inside again you know if we pursued something along the lines of what graham is you know kicking around maybe we should think about hey should we do this in september or october to yeah. you know kind of hey come into a restaurant and um and i think once people go in one time and they're like oh this is you know this isn't this is nice and they'll come back and so maybe we we should think about the the calendar timing of when we do it. Yeah, I would just worry that we would target a time when people weren't allowed to go in. Um, that's so, yeah, that's definitely like, yeah, we're not in control of the viruses. No, yeah. Um, so you all are learning about this just as I am. Um, and somebody who understands unemployment that's one of you who used to serve on commerce, I think. It's not me. <laughs> um, might be able to understand this and explain it and say, give some thoughts about whether it's an idea worth pursuing. Uh, Emily. Um, I think this might be one of the first times I've ever agreed with Austin on something. So I'm really excited about it. Um, well, I, I, I got enough out of it to decide it was worth sharing. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that um, was I got. You know, there's this really interesting phenomenon um, with nonprofits where instead of um, for their employees, they pay, and um, you know, someone from Lutch Council can explain this better than I'm going to, but this is a brief overview. Um, instead of, and you all might know this already, instead of paying into the regular UI fund for employees, they um, get to basically be in this category where they cover their own, they have to reimburse the unemployment fund after they've had a claim. Um, and a lot, most nonprofits opt into this. The place I work does, some huge institutions in my community do as well. Um, it's always struck me as a um, not a great risk proposition, but nonprofits seem to be, you know, be doing it anyway because it um, helps costs cut costs in the short term. And so this particular um, mass of layoffs has been incredibly difficult for nonprofits in our communities, especially um, places like schools, um, summer camps, wilderness organizations, sort of the nonprofits that are a little outside of human services, but on the edge of human services or... Um, but what about arts organizations? Arts organizations as well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they tend to have fewer employees and more um, <laughs> higher up like other costs, but yes, um, arts organizations. Um, also adult day facilities have had huge layoffs um, and have had this problem. And so the um, 
the money that came from the feds that created the pandemic unemployment insurance and all of that um, also created a mechanism so that 50% um, of those costs could be covered for nonprofits, which was a huge win, but it still leaves them with a really tremendous debt load to um, our trust fund. And so I think this would really go a long way to supporting some of the nonprofits that are struggling right now. Um, so this is a slight shifting of gears, but it's an interesting idea. Other, um, other thoughts that people have? about it. I, I'm trying to raise my hand, but I can't Oh, I'm it. sorry. I don't, I, I uh, so, uh, okay. yeah, Sam Scott Robin, or Sam Robin Scott Joey. Great. I think it's a, I think it's a reasonable thing to do with 5 million, because the, the state is also a reimbursable employer and municipalities, I don't know about colleges, but I suppose they could be. But, but for just like the smaller nonprofits, that would be, it might be in the ballpark of 5 million and it would be a really good thing to do. I mean, they were, you know, they also laid people off through no fault of their own um, and are hurting and probably donations have dried up. I mean, I think of things like libraries and museums and um, yeah, the world that I know better on, but yeah, uh, Robin and Scott. Yeah, I, I think this is a great idea. I certainly heard when everything um, went south in March, heard from a lot of nonprofits who are reimbursable, including uh, one of our adult daycare centers and one of our arts organizations and things like that. So it, it seems to me um, it would be good. We, we we'd probably have to put some parameters around it, um, I guess, uh, if that's our job. I'm not really sure where our job is. Um, and it just brings up the longer question for the future about is this the way, should there be this reimbursable thing, but maybe that's a commerce thing for next session. Anyway, it's just something in, in my head, but I support this. Uh, Scott. Um, I, I, my only comment is, I mean, it's, it's certainly a worthy cause. Um, I, I would like to know what, what com I mean, I'm sure commerce is trying to deal with a lot of UI issues right now. And mm -hmm. Austin says nobody else is looking at it, but that I think we need to find out if somebody else is looking at it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I mean, we have, well, we have to tell, we have today. <laughs> so we may end up having to say we think this is a really good idea if nobody else is looking at it um but yeah. you know it's um, and it doesn't it doesn't um um it doesn't exclude our putting other ideas out there as well so um uh i just had a note from uh oh peter is there peter and then graham had a graham sent me a note and so i'm not going to speak uh, thank you very much. The reason I thought of this is I worried that nonprofits, whether they're arts or social service or daycare or museums and galleries, are, are um, potentially orphaned in our committee system in the sense that economic development and the agency and so on generally focus most of their horsepower on for-profit enterprises. And so I threw it in as potentially an orphan uh, activity, but one which is very very important to the host communities. Uh, Graham. Um, I, don't, I, I just wanna make one quick comment. I, I think this is a, a, a good cause. I am, from the tax perspective, I'm trying to think about a way to get it to nonprofits by December 31st through the tax code. Um, I don't exactly how I don't know exactly how it would work unless maybe we did some sort of advanced credit thing again, where we, we issue checks to the tax department. It's just something I think a detail that would need to be ironed out um, if this if the committee was were to move forward. Um, and I think maybe talking to the tax department would be would be helpful if the committee moves forward on this because I don't quite know how um, we could get the, the five million into the hands of nonprofits. Um, well, it, I mean, 
we're not required to do it through the tax code. We could do it. Are you thinking we would need to do it through the tax code because we're the tax committee or? Yeah, that's, that's why was my understanding of the discussion. I mean, I don't know if you the limits to just issue grants or anything like that. Um, but well, we're fortunately, we're not actually doing anything. We're oh. just <laughs> coming up with ideas to, to share. Um, um, and so, yeah, okay. ideally, I, I, I agree with you. Ideally, an idea, something that we come up with ought to have a connection with the tax code. Um, but it's, it's really challenging to do that for all the reasons that we've just been discussing because we can't replace revenue um, and that any kind of tax credit and so on, just it does, you can't get the money out in time. So yeah. we're not in a, it, it, this is not a world where our great inno, innovation and creativity is very valuable, um, unfortunately. Bill, Mark, Peter. Yeah, Jenna, our task here is to prioritize where we want to use this money. Unless um, we, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Unless I know, unless we know that someone else is taking care of small businesses, I can't prioritize nonprofits. Okay, that's fine. I, I think it's, I think it's um, the tier one and tier two talked a bit about priorities, but I, I really think that what the speaker was looking at looking for was for each committee sort of within its area to um, see um, whether there were recommendations um, that, you know, did that help the economy, help for monitors, I can't remember, there were three things, um, fit within the uh, restrictions of the um, CARES Act that, um, that that we wanted to recommend. So I don't I don't think the speaker was saying that each committee should say, you know, we think broadband should be number one or whatever. Um, we could do that, but I don't think that's exactly what she was looking for. But I, I get your point, um, Mark and Peter. Um, I, I just wanted to point out, I, I'm looking at the uh, the guidance um, that was released um, on May fourth, and this is specifically allowed. Um, as a use for CRF money, so. Yeah, yeah. So why is nobody else looking at it or do we know? Um, I, I don't know. Um, okay, then it may be somebody is. Uh, Peter. I just, um, because uh, it seems to me one of the suggestions that we had, if we couldn't coalesce around a specific strategy, we could simply make a recommendation to the Appropriations Committee that our share be directed, uh, whether it's small business, restaurants, or uh, nonprofits uh, and, and the like, uh, should receive some extra boost. And they could use our money to accomplish that uh, as long as it met the criteria. It's a way around this, um, the, the trouble, the complexity of us working within our usual world of taxation seems terrifically daunting. Uh, other comments anyone has? I think that's what the the summary that uh, Sorsha distributed kind of indicated is that there probably isn't an agreement on the committee where the priority is. So, um, Jim, and we'll all get a chance to vote at some point. Jim I'll doesn't. admit to being, other than my wacky idea, not particularly helpful in this discussion, but I'd I'd like to go back to Emily's comment and a few other people saying, you know, it's now summer, it's all easy this time of year, comparatively speaking, and in, in, in the sustainability of our efforts through the fall and winter are really going to be where the rubber hits the road. And I'm kind of at a loss at how to use our little corner of the process to help there, other than really wacky ideas that are disallowed. Yeah. Like replacing revenue. Well, I, you know, in terms of a tax holiday, whether it's meals tax or something else, the meals is the one that strikes me as most useful, maybe. But um, the, um, I've never supported them. I don't typically like them. I do think the economic environment that we're in right now that it may make sense. Um, 
you know, I'd feel comfortable saying if we could use the money this way, this is, this is, a, you know, an area that we think is worth pursuing. But this is not going to be final legislation. This, this bill um, earmarks money for certain things. Um, I think that's the bill that they're trying to put together. It doesn't deal with all the details. Um, and, you know, there's X amount for healthcare, X amount for uh, small business, X amount for higher ed, X amount for K-12. It's that kind of thing. Um, you know, so it may be that something can be figured out um, or that the rules will change enough or some other state will tell us a great way to do something. Um, and, you know, we could say, I certainly would be willing to say that a tax holiday in this environment is a good idea if we were able to do it. If we're not able to do it, these are some other areas that we think are worth exploring. Um, but I don't, um, I'm not sure where everybody is. So other ideas, thoughts? Want to move on to school construction? Um, yeah, Madam Chair, would you like me to talk about the the childcare thing that I? Um, yeah, it's something else. It's it something another committee is working on, right? Right. Yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah. yesterday, I remember hearing the committee talk a little bit about childcare being something that they might want to look at. Um, the Senate Ec Education Committee did a fair amount of work on a. Um, a tax credit um, for parents that had out-of-pocket childcare costs um, during the, the closure of childcare. So um, back when the, the childcare centers were not open, the state essentially paid 50% of the cost to the childcare provider and then the parents had to pay the other 50% of the cost even though they weren't sending their kids to childcare anymore. This was a tax credit that was, um, I think it was $500 per child. And it, it was up to, um, it was 100% of the cost paid by the parent. I think Graham's frozen. So. Wait for him to unfreeze. Well, this brings up a little side note. I had an email yesterday from a constituent that the soonest install date for a new internet connection through Consolidated is September 15th. So, we're doing good. Yeah, my, my uh, and, and yeah, you're back. You're back. We, we if you were talking, we missed it. <laughs> but we got to look at you. <laughs> I was like, I wonder why nobody's reacting. <laughs> um, you got to uh, five hundred dollars a child, one hundred percent of the cost paid by the parent, and I think that's when you froze. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's five hundred dollars per child, one hundred percent of the cost. Um, it was for a period between March first and sometime in June. Um, and I know I'm missing some specifics here. There was no AGI limit, so it didn't have any anyone could claim this credit. Um, and I preliminarily had that costing around seven to eight million dollars. So. It's somewhat in the neighborhood of the five million. It's in the tax code, um, and it was, it's something that the committee has discussed as a as a thing that they want to look at because there there was a period when there were many families paying for childcare necessary that they were just holding the spot, um, and so this was an attempt by at least that committee to um, provide some assistance to those families. And what's happened to the idea? It hasn't moved forward since. Um, oh, I see. They did work on it, but they didn't move it. They did not move it, no. And it was in the Senate Education Committee, so I don't know exactly 
um, how or why it was originating in there. And I never, I never even testified on it, but I did work on estimates. Abby had written up language on it. Um, and so, but I think at the time it may have been, it was slowed down by the fact that it wasn't sure whether we could use CRF or such a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't have a, I don't have a ruling on this one either, but it, it seems, uh, it, I wouldn't rule it out of hand as not being available to for you wouldn't be able to use, you would be able to use CRF here because it is related to the public health emergency. And when do you get the tax credit? What's that? When do you get the tax credit? So that was in the bill. You would get it when you apply for your income taxes. Um, so, so it would well, not work. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. So but you could, in theory, if you you could do something like this advanced tax credit or something like that. Um, but how would you how would you do that if people hadn't filed? So I, I just um, yeah. don't want to be arguing it, but the the if if it's a tax credit and it's an income tax credit, there has to be an income tax filing to credit against, right? Right. Or you it, you would turn it into something like you you would submit your childcare expenses to tax and then they would issue like a credit of some sort in advance, not, not against your income tax, but just as a similar to like how the IRS has, has sent out stimulus checks in a way. So again, these details need, would need to be ironed out, I agree. Um, yeah. But it is something that was discussed um, and it was somewhat close to, to $5 million. So I thought I would bring it up. Uh, Jim and Emily. Um, just off topic, but related to Sam's comment about internet connections, um, we're aware that the state would do well to have a training program for people to install um, fiber optic cable, but to try to get that ramped up and everybody paid by the first of the year is really, really a problem, even though it's a no brainer. Just thought I'd offer that out. Thank you. Emily. Um, I think I get a federal child care tax credit. Um, you, sh you probably do. Okay. Yeah. And so <laughs> I know I check a box somewhere and then some money happens. Um, and so I wonder if, um, and then do, I guess I wonder, this is a super beginner's question about how this all works. So for does the state tax department get to see our federal tax returns at all or have yeah. access to that? Yeah, and there's there's a state child care credit that piggybacks on the federal one, right, Graham? Yeah, the, the child and dependent care credit. It's yeah, it, it's um, it's somewhat limited. It, 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 the income thresholds are quite low, and I think the total cost of Vermont is, I won't say more than two million dollars. Um, so that's the Vermont. Side. But there, but there is a link between our credit it's, and the federal credit. So yeah, it's uh, already that communication happening. Yeah, I think it's twenty four percent of the federal credit. I think it is. Yeah. And so okay. if we, and so that means that we already know who it would be eligible for this, because um, they're folks who are paying for childcare. Not necessarily, because um, a lot of people who pay for child care don't even file for that credit because their income is, is too high. The other reason they might not apply is, um, for instance, like I, when I was sending my daughter to child care, we're, was using um, a flexible spending account, and you cannot yeah. double, you can't kick credit and you use a flexible spending account. So I made the determination that it was better for me to use the flexible spending account. So um, not nearly as many people file for the child independent care credit as the people who actually use child care in the state. Um, and so there's a lot of dynamics going on in child care in terms of out of pocket costs because we also have the CC FAT program, yeah. which um, reimburses a lot of low income, um, low and middle income families for their child care expenses. And so that's one of the reasons why I think that the, the our child independent care credit is not actually that expensive to the state is because we are subsidizing child care mostly through um, to the CC FAT program from lower and middle income families. What this credit, the beneficiaries of this credit that I'm talking about would really be those who don't get CC FAT. Mm -hmm. um, a, a little higher income. Mm -hmm. A little bit Not higher, higher income, income, but a little higher. 
Oh, well, yeah. actually, we said there's no upper limit, so it would there's be no upper limit. So a little higher to get yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there would be people who weren't getting the child dependent care credit, not people on CC fat, or they could be on CC fat, but just not getting fully. Um, Having could they have not getting, Yeah, they have to pay some sort of copay. Um, so it, it would affect a broad range of filers. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's why the cost was relatively high for a roughly two three month tax credit. Okay. Um, and, but, I'm sorry. I'm but, suggesting it just because that would mean that we could sort of send it out now saying we know that you, you know, paid this in the darn. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's the issue is that you, it, it, the bill as it was imagined was you, you, and with most tax credits, like everything in the tax code, it's an income tax credit, you would file it next year. And that is not CRF permissible because the money needs to go out before December 31st. So, uh, yeah, in order for something like this to work through the tax code, you would have to somehow create some sort of credit. Well, you'd be spending um, a lot of money on administration for a one-time payment. Yeah, it would be a one-time payment. Yeah, It'd be one time, one time, but you'd have to set up a whole system for people to apply and to do some kind of audit or whatever. I mean, because you wouldn't have the income tax. Is it a refundable credit? Yes. No. Well, interesting. Emily and Scott. What about a refundable advance credit to childcare providers? Because we know who they are because they've paid some sort of taxes and or they're already connected, like they're already licensed. Um, Um, because we know that they're folding right now because of all these financial struggles. Right. So you, if so, a I don't know exactly how all child care providers file. They might be some of them might be nonprofits, some of them might be um, partnerships. So they might file an income tax return. So even if you were to look at their income, it would be backward looking, right? So you'd have their income from last year, and so that's definitely not reflective of what their income is this year. Um, the second thing is. Um, the that wouldn't be in addition to all the to the, the support that the state has provided thus far for child care providers so um i i am aware that the, there are centers holding the state did provide during that time when there was closure they did pay 50 percent of the cost or the tuition that they would receive um so i'm not an expert in terms of knowing what the need is but i do think um uh, a credit Anything that's based upon income of either an individual or a business, I think is going to be there very difficult to get, get out before December 31st without setting up some sort of administrative yeah. thing. Be because you're going to have to, in order to get a, a tax credit of any sort out by December 31st that's not related to income, someone is going to have to check that the expenses were made or um, people are going to have to make applications for it. Um, and it's going to have to be processed by someone. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know whether that capacity exists at the current moment in tax or not. So, but that's the only way um, to do to to um, get more accurate or to get money out the door. I mean, it's very possible the committee could decide to use backward-looking tax information. That's not allow but it's not going to be a reflection of what people's income or businesses income is going to be so for instance like the the federal stimulus checks used tax year 2018 and 19 information to send you the checks that was what that was based on and lots of people were upset because that's not what their income is now so it's not unheard of but it's you do run into that issue um that the income is not going to be necessarily reflective of what their current state is so Scott. I think I think I'm inclined to let some of the other committees help child care. Um, this is kind of where I'm falling out. Um, the hospitality industry, the people that they, they collect one hundred and sixty million dollars in trust taxes every year and send it to us to spend um, the daycare industry, child care. Um, it's very it's a fantastic industry. They don't collect any trust taxes. 
um, and they don't pay any business taxes if they're not profitable. So I'm, I'm thinking that I'd, I'm a lot more interested in preserving a $160 million revenue stream um, and let another committee handle childcare. Anyone else? I think, I think my reluctance about this is just that I don't understand it well enough. I wouldn't know how to design something for childcare providers because I don't understand the business model well enough to sort of think what it might be. But um, I certainly support work that other committees are doing on this where they, I know human services spends a lot of time on it. Uh, Robin. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I just want to also point out that um, a lot of places probably aren't going to be able to open if there isn't childcare um, for people to go work in those restaurants or in those hotels. This is a lot of um, lower paid people. So it's all connected. It's pretty hard to, to dissected and I'm not suggesting that's where it should or we should be spending our money but I just want to make that point that um, it's all connected. Yep. Um, anyone else? Sam. I guess I just would say that I'm I would like to put a, a priority forward from our committee. And, and at this point, I don't actually, like, I don't want to, I'm willing to go along with whatever the majority of people are willing to get behind. Um, sounds like it's leaning towards uh, restaurants, but also, I mean, I'd be happy to do the unemployment for nonprofits, either or. Um, mm -hmm. That feels like the, the highest level ones that, I'm, I'm feeling coming forward, but I would I would like to put a priority forward from our. We'd like like the committee to say something. Yes. Yes, as opposed. And I'm willing to, to, willing to go along with a, a majority of what other people are willing to yeah. say. I just. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm I'm I, I'm sort of right where you are, and um, I it, it's very hard. This is one of the things that make these remote meetings so difficult. We were sitting in the room. I probably know where a majority of people were, but I don't here. Um, and so I need, I need people to, to say, um, to, to offer an idea and, and let people weigh in on it because I can't, I can't read the room as easily when I'm in my kitchen. Um, Peter, uh, Robin, I'm sorry, you were on first and then Peter. Thanks. Um, if we are going to set for something, I'd recommend that we do two. I think that the unemployment for nonprofits is also really important, uh, as well as doing something for restaurants. Okay, Peter. I I uh, I want to second that. I I think helping uh, any uh, small business. Let me frame it that way. Whether they're for profit or nonprofit. In the, within the universe of UI, and that obligation is probably uh, something I, I think that would unify our message, that we want to figure out a scheme which uh, supports uh, or, or uh, uh, lessens the UI bill for both profits and nonprofits of smallish businesses around the state, especially connected to the hospitality and restaurant business. That's a kind of general uh, statement I think that uh, most people could could get behind and it, the unifying thing is that we we are involved in UI taxes. So I, that's a new idea I think that what we're talking that we're talking about UI for um, for profit businesses. I I thought is that are, did other people know that we were talking about that? I didn't. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, I, I thought what we were talking about was the UI for nonprofits because they're in this unique situation. Um, and that if we can come, if we can figure out the right way to do it, um, something by way of the tax code um, or uh, as in recognition of tax obligations or something, um, something for restaurants. 
not saying it very well, but it that felt like those were different things. Sam. I, I also thought we were talking about uh, UI obligations for nonprofits. Yeah. Um, and because we already we already relieved for the for profits, we already relieved um, experience rating for people that were laid off for co off uh, for COVID. So we've already done it in the for profit, and this is for nonprofit. This is um, so are we coalescing around something as um, unable to articulate it as I am? Um, are, are we, are people, would people be comfortable if the committee's communication to house appropriations focused on these two areas um, with a, um, something that says, you know, obviously, um, if the need is greater elsewhere, I mean, this, it's not like we have a stake in the ground, um, but, but these are ideas that we've spent a little time talking about and trying to understand. Bill. Yeah, I wanna go back to what Sam was just saying. You mean that uh, nonprofit employees that were laid off did not get uh, unemployment insurance? Sam. Um, no, what I mean is that they would have got unemployment insurance, but that the nonprofit itself has to fully reimburse the amount because they don't they don't pay it as insurance. They actually have to pay it out of their own pocket after the fact because they don't pay a monthly or a, a premium on their wages. Oh, they don't pay into the fund. Right. They don't pay into the fund. They just have to pay the full out-of-pocket cost of the unemployment. It's a different impact on the employer. Right. Yeah. So what so this this idea would try to make the impact similar for nonprofits as it is for uh, for profits. So Janet, we're gonna list these as prioritized. Um, and... I I haven't written anything. So I, I you... don't I don't know. <laughs> Um, and as usual, I'm looking for guidance. Um, I'm thinking probably um, that they wouldn't, they'd be two ideas, um, not prioritized, because I don't get a sense really of whether the committee um, feels strongly, more strongly about one than the other. But if I'm wrong, please, people, please tell me. Uh, Scott. I just want to say, I just sent, a, I don't know if, some, if anybody else has, I sent an email over to to commerce and ask them if they're looking at this too. Oh, good, great, okay. And and I had a text message pop out of the ether that said no other committee is looking at this issue. Did the text message come from a reliable source? Yes. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. As a matter of fact, it was a former committee assistant of the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> narrows it down, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, Good, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, good. Well, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, uh, this has been interesting work. It, it's unlike most of the work we do, we're trying to think of something as opposed to react to something that's put in front of us and that's hard, um, as I said, especially in this, in my kitchen. Um, so I'm gonna give us a momentary break. Um, and uh, I wanna just spend a, a few minutes on the school construction bill. Um, and I think we're not gonna run all the way to noon cause I, um, I mean, to 11, whatever time we were headed for. Um, um, partly because I've got to, somebody's gotta write this communication to house appropriations. First of all, is there a volunteer to do a draft on that? I'm looking at, I, Drafters, come on, people. <laughs> no, nobody wants to volunteer. Okay, well, I will volunteer somebody, but I'll do it privately. Um, so, um, so we need to come up with something that needs to be circulated and people need to look at it. Um, but school construction. Uh, we heard testimony last week that was not very positive about the bill that we were looking at. Um, and I just wondered if people had 
reactions, sort of where people were thinking um, and whether, uh, what should be our next step, Sam? Uh, did uh, the secretary or the executive director of the yes. Superintendents Association offer us some language? Um, we got a communication from the secretary, I think. Am I right, Sorsha? Something came this morning. Or did it just come to me? Um, no, he sent written testimony um, based on the testimony he provided last week. And I did send posted. that to the committee this morning and posted it on, on right. the 24th. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know I'd seen it somewhere. Um, so did it come, but is it from you or is it from him? It, it was in the email this morning with the Zoom link and the agenda and the documents. I could also pull it up if you like. Yeah, why don't we look at okay. it? Thank you. I know I'd seen it and I just couldn't figure out where. Emily. One thing I'm confused about from the um, testimony we heard last week and from this written testimony is um, the resistance to the COVID nexus with this bill. Um, and I feel like um, you articulated, we all articulated quite clearly that we were sort of interested in looking into the future construction needs of the school with regard to public health. And that's sort of where the nexus is. We weren't just talking about, you know, like plexiglass dividers that are needed for three months. Um, you know, that air quality and health quality is an important part of school construction and that that's sort of where the nexus was sitting. And so I'm not sure how to make that um, clearer before we, I'm worried that we're gonna get recommendations before um, the folks from AOE and the superintendents understand that that's where we were coming from. Um, Cause I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was one of those things that was getting sort of um, uh, articulated as we were talking about it. Um, so I think it was, I think there was some misunderstanding in the beginning The the um, thought I have is that when we do school construction from here on in, we ought to think about how we're gonna make sure that kids can be educated safely um, in, a, in the building. Um, and the, the idea is get, keep, get them in the building. Um, because teaching remotely is um, works for a few people and works on some subjects and uh, there are a lot of and works in some ages but for a lot it's just not it it's, doesn't have the same um, quality and the kids don't learn as well so um, I think I think that was uh, a miscommunication um, so this is the memo that came um, I don't it, it, I'm not sure people did have a chance to look at it because it, it was um, did come in this morning. So um, I, I guess I mean when people have had a chance to look at it, um, I think I'm still left with a question about whether what whether there is something that can uh, move ahead in the context of this bill um, that we feel will be valuable um, and based on the testimony we heard from um, the superintendents and the secretary of education that whether they also feel it's valuable. Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, this this is also it should we, it it is something that um, should be done soon if we're going to do it, but it's not urgent that it has to be done by the end of June necessarily. So there may be some time to think about it a little bit more and spend a little more time um, having uh, you know getting other folks in into the committee, and it you know it may also be something to bounce back to the. House Education Committee. That's another thought. Uh, Robin. 
I, I think this is worth pursuing. I'm not ready to, to drop it at this point. It, maybe it is we continue into August or whatever and get education involved. But I think I think we have this opportunity, a, a unique time, and we have to be thinking about long term. I'm, I am puzzled by the uh, resistance and the um, maybe the misunderstanding that this is really about long term. And as you said, how can kids be educated safely in the building, not just this fall, but Forever. years from now? Um, we, we really, this is our opportunity to look at that and we should be, um, we should be doing that. I think it's, we, we have a responsibility to do that, so. Uh, Peter. Um, I would point out that both uh, Jeff Francis and Secretary French <clears throat> uh, made an observation that has always um, impressed me, namely, there's a certain segment uh, of the school districts, which historically have had a difficult time passing budgets. Those are also the ones that are difficult, uh, have difficulty uh, uh, getting uh, a community behind a construction bond. And consequently that, I, I wanna say third, uh, who are on the probably lower uh, spending uh, spectrum per pupil are the ones that probably uh, are struggling with a uh, physical plant, bricks and mortar, that are most in need of um, updating or replacement uh, in the sense in which we've been talking about it, namely, can you create a safe indoor environment, particularly in the air handling system, and create flexibility in that space? Um, because if, if bricks and mortar have not been replaced in the last 20 or 25 years, which is very likely for those communities that have a hard time passing a budget, those are probably the ones that should be at the front of the line uh, in terms of uh, state participation. Anyone else have a thought about this? Um, you know, maybe this is one of those um, moments when it would be helpful to me anyway and to the committee to have a couple people on the committee take this issue and do some work on it and bring something back. Um, I, I, I feel that if, if, if we had heard positive testimony from advocates and from the secretary, um, we, we were probably coming close to an agreement on a bill, but we didn't hear that. So, um, so obviously we need to do more work, whether it's um, you know private discussions or a different a draft that is um, you know, um, maybe states what we're trying to do more clearly. I don't know. Uh, so I will see if there's a couple people who would like to volunteer to do that. I've got one volunteer. The second one, I got Scott and I got Peter. Is that what I got? That would be great. Um, anybody else who's interested um, should, you know, stay involved with it. But um, I'm, I'm not sure that as a group we're going to sit here and come up with a a, a different draft. Um, I mean, I think it is. Um, I'm willing to try to do that, but I I think it would be great if if there can be some work outside the committee. And uh, Robin. Um. I just was looking back at my notes from June 4th when they were both uh, speaking in our committee and Jeff Francis said that they'd get back to us next week with specifics on our bill. So that was last week. So perhaps, you know, we'll have some information from him as well. Yeah, maybe. Um, and that was uh, Secretary French, this, that's the testimony that he just provided was his follow up on that. Um, so. We have his, but not Jeff Francis. I, I don't. I don't have it anyway. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, Peter. I, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate refreshing my memory, for the sake of Scott and I moving ahead. Um, I don't remember hearing uh, a, a, a discouraging word on our idea of trying to at least uh, uh, evaluate the existing universe in terms of need, antiquatedness, uh, suitability for safe occupancy. 
that section of our proposal. And, and yet nobody, uh, yeah, I'm reading very quickly in Secretary French, nobody said, gee, that's great. I think you ought to hang on to that notion of making a, a funding an evaluative study of the existing bricks and mortar. I'm kind of surprised about that. I think that that was removed from the bill, which is why they were, that's the part of the bill that they wanted to keep in. And the, and the reason why it's out of the bill, quite frankly, is, is um, uh, we were hearing from our own staff that they didn't feel that they could manage that kind of study in the time frame that we were looking at. It doesn't mean it shouldn't get done. It just means they not, don't, didn't feel that they could do it now. So, um, so the request I'd make of um, Scott and Peter is also to work with Catherine uh, Benham, who's been uh, the point person for uh, joint fiscal on this. And I'll speak for myself. I, will, I would like very much to have our joint fiscal staff involved in whatever study gets produced. Um, and partly it's because if it's legislative staff that's um, doing the handling the RFP and the contract, um, it does mean that the questions that we have as legislators will actually get answered. Um, and that is important to me if we're going to spend million bucks or whatever we're spending. So they, they have a tremendous amount of work to do right now. And um, we will. Catherine, did you want to speak? No. I'm just listening. And I wanted to know you to know I was, I was listening. So that's yeah. all. Yeah. Happy to work with um, yeah. your, your little subcommittee. Yeah. I think what we heard from uh, both uh, witnesses last week is that the original bill was, was an assessment. Um, and um, that that has now morphed into this more um, uh, uh, trying to um, think about what we really are asking schools to do and what we're, you know, this whole notion of, of making sure that whatever money we spend on construction um, is, is geared to making sure that kids can be in school in a safe way um, and that that's a different perspective. I think that's what they were objecting to. I believe that's right. Other, other thoughts? Okay. So I'm gonna, um, oops, Peter again. What's up? Um, I'm, I'm a little, just to be clear, was it daunting because the uh, Department of Edu Agency of Education had so much on their plate? Because originally I thought this yeah. was JFO work, not uh, AOE. And the other part of my question is, is it daunting because we didn't specify any kind of uh, subset universe to, to examine closely? And we just said all the buildings, which which may seem daunting. Do you want me to? So, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll be happy to speak to it. No, I, it's daunting because we have a lot on our plate right now for the sum of all you're coming back. We just have a lot of, um, we often have, you know, several months of time when we can do studies and, and with you all coming back in August, I don't know when you're leaving. I don't, you're coming back in August. I don't know how long uh, the legislature will be meeting then. It's, um, it's, it's just, I'm, I worry about the level of work that this report will require and the bandwidth we will have for it this particular year. You know, I think in other summers, it would be a typical summer, it would be much simpler. It's just not, we just have a lot of different demands and there are other studies that are also being proposed at the same time as this one. So- um, Quite a few actually that um, yeah. you're involved with. And I'm, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The reason why we keep asking you to do these things is you do actually really good work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's work that I feel that when we get it, we can make decisions based on, on what you give us. And so, um, and, and it's helpful if it's work that is going to inform decisions that we make yeah. If we're 
involved in the study in the sense that we can develop the questions and we can sort of um, check in on the progress of the study. And so I, I would like very much to have joint fiscal involved with this. And um, I understand that you, you're, uh, you've been a little oversubscribed. Yes, I appreciate all the good words, and I, I think we do try our best to do good work and studies, but that does require a fair amount of uh, work on our part, even when you're hiring a contractor, it requires a lot of, um, you know, making sure they're staying on topic and, and, and refocusing things and, and as new topics come up. So it's, it's, it's just a question of how much can we have on our plate at one time and do a good job with it. And um, there are other other bills have us working on other studies as well this summer. So we're, we need to, in the end, figure out what makes sense and what is reasonable. Um, it would, you I don't want to do a bad job. Study. It's just not, it's not the full assessment that we, we were talking about in March. Emily. That's right. Um, slightly broader question, but wondering if there's been, given that we're working through the summer and so Ledge Council and JFO are also working through the summer and doing sort of regular legislative stuff and so there's no, you know, staffing space for most of the summer studies and committees. Is has there been a conversation about adding additional temporary staff to Ledge Council and JFO with the CRF funds? Hmm. I, I actually have not heard that. I mean, to be, mm -hmm. I, it, it might be more work for us to take on somebody and get them up to speed. Um, we do, we do have some people who work part time, and they they will work more hours over the summer than they might typically work. I think, and um, I think legislative council, for example, committee staff, they have their pool. They don't, you know, I think they're using committee staff in ways that they haven't in the past. Part time committee staff. So, in that sense, the answer is I'm sorry. I should say yes. We have talked about using CRF funds, but not really to hire somebody new. It's more about um, the cost that we're expending. It, to staff all of this work over the summer. Um, so in that sense, we the answer is yes. Not new staff, but current staff, just more hours. More hours, yeah. Yeah. All right, anything else? Um, I will, I, uh, there will be a draft circulated. <laughs> I'm not sure who's gonna write it. Um, so um, be checking your email um, and, and I think that's it. I'm not sure whether we'll meet tomorrow. Um, I don't have anything on the schedule unless Peter and Scott come up with an idea for us to look at tomorrow on this issue. And I'm guessing you may not be ready by tomorrow, but you let me know. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just checking. Uh, Sarsha is going to send us that uh, note from Dan French. She did. I sent it this morning, Bill, with yeah. the um, Zoom link. Yep. It, it was part of the Zoom link. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And I, it's now probably posted as well, right? I think so. Yes, um, it's posted for um, last Thursday, the day that he testified. Right. Yep. So unless something comes up, um, between today and tomorrow. I don't think we'll meet tomorrow, um, but do be looking at your email for um, a draft. All right. Good. Thank you.